Hannah, where are you? I saw you. Okay, do you have a microphone? Stand up so everyone can see you. I asked your dad, what is she going to ask? He says, I don't know. I said, well, let's see. So we're ready. Okay. Um, my question was, if God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and he also says that he, um, I do not delight in the punishment of the wicked, but rather that they would turn and be saved, um, then why... And it also says then that he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills, then how do you reconcile the two that God doesn't want people to perish, but he also says he hardens whomever he wills? That is a great question. <laughs> I think that's what she asked last month. Um, uh, and uh, let me just say this. First of all, if there was an answer to that, the church would not be divided over this since um, well, for a long time. The first time it started getting divided over this was, uh, uh, let's see, about then. St. Augustine started fighting with a guy named Pelagius over that very question. Basically, asking about the balance between the whosoever will let him come and the chosen in him before the foundation of the world, or between Second Peter 3 um, about verse 9 that says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And then Hannah also quoted from Romans 9, which is a wonderful uh, text from which the two sides get uh, what we call dual, I'm writing too small, aren't I? Um, dual predestination. <laughs> Um, in fact, um, predestination. Uh, let, let me just ask you, uh, you've all heard of predestination, right? Everyone that's heard of predestination, hold your hand up. That is only three places in the Bible. It's one of the least talked about things in the Bible, yet this whole concept of predestination has, has just caused tumult in the church. But... Um, First of all, let's look at the, the passages she's talking about. So everybody open your Bible to the first one uh, that Hannah mentioned. And by the way, her question is reflected in a lot of emails and a lot of hallway chats. And so this is an important one. And, and if you're not yet a Bible marker, I am, you ought to be a Bible marker. You ought to um, not mark what I say, but mark the verse and, and your thoughts as you're thinking about it to kind of start cultivating your own systematic theology um, from your study of the scripture. But Second Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 9, is where Hannah started. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, that, that is right in the middle, that verse is right in the middle of Peter giving us uh, probably one of the most practical teachings on how to live as the world is ending. In fact, it, it's all about the world ending. Look at verse 10. The very next verse is about the end of the world, the day of the Lord. Uh, what, what we uh, describe are the events that culminate at the end of the tribulation. But, but what he talks about here is how we're supposed to live. And this particular one is that we're supposed to pick up the Lord's desire. See, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. You know what? Neither should we. Uh, but I won't say, it, this is a very controversial verse, so I will not try and cultivate the idea of the, the call of God or the unlimited, limited atonement from this verse because actually that word perish um, does describe what the Lord said is going to happen to a lot of people. So we know already that it doesn't mean the Lord wants uh, no one to suffer the vengeance of everlasting fire because he already knows that many are going to. Uh, that whoever believeth, uh, remember it says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. 
That means all the people that don't believe in him are going to perish. And so in the sense that God is not willing in that he is sovereign isn't what this verse is saying. But what it is saying is we should live redemptively. The other thing, and, and before I get away from it too far, go back to uh, Romans uh, 9. That's the other passage that uh, Hannah quoted from. She's talking about uh, what we get this, this dual predestination concept from, that some people are predestined or, or it's called uh, reprobation. Um, rep, you've heard of reprobates. Well, there are some that are uh, under reprobation. They're elected to reprobation. They're predestined uh, to destruction. And that comes from chapter 9 uh, of Romans. Look at verse 22. Uh, now remember, Romans, everything has a context. Always remember that. You know, we always have to look at where we are. Remember Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a very important passage. It's talking about God's sovereign election of Israel and their rejection of him, so his temporarily setting them aside. Temporarily, because he says God is going to again deal with them. But right in the middle of that discussion in verse 22, look what it says. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Ah, so, so here are the ones that are, that are prepared for this destruction, this reprobation. Um, and look at verse 23. So verse 22 is talking about a group of people that are prepared for this destruction. Ah, prepared. So... Um, that's verse 22. Now look at verse 23. That he might make known, to the, make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. See the, the parallelism? The vessels of wrath in verse 22. The vessels of mercy in verse 23. Which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Whoa. Now we've got... Uh, in verse 23, we've got prepared for glory. Now, I'll tie this together in just a minute, but from this, we get the concept that you've heard about in theology of dual predestination, that some people are predestined for heaven, some people are predestined for hell. Now, predestination is a very specific word. It's only used six times in the Bible. Twice, Christ crucifixion was predestined. So we know predestination is very big in the Bible. It's huge. It's something God determines that will happen. But the other four times it's used, predestination, it's never for individuals. It's only for groups. So I'm going to be talking a lot tonight about logic and the Bible. It's logical to come to a dual predestination idea that, that would make you wonder, how can God not be willing that any should perish? And we're going to talk about that, about the universal offer of the gospel, if it's real. Uh, it is. Um, whether the atonement is limited or unlimited, okay? Um, not whether it's logical. And see, I, and, and I have no... Uh, desire to undermine uh, anybody's theology. But I will point out the parts of theology that aren't supported by the scriptures. And you can find the same thing yourself. Uh, my favorite theologian is Wayne Grudem. I'm teaching from his book to the elders and deacons. It's going to take us years to go through it. We do one chapter a month and it has 58 chapters. It takes five years to go through. But Wayne Grudem can go for three pages without citing a single verse because there isn't a single verse in the Bible that says that doctrine. It's only logically deduced. It's not biblical. It's logical. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it does mean it's not biblical. Dual predestination is never, never presented in the Bible, ever, not even here. And so it's logical to come to that conclusion, but it's not biblical. So look, look what is presented here. Look at verse 22. God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, Romans 9, 22, endured with much long suffering. That means that 
sin offends God, and he, he holds back his wrath. Reminds me of something that happened at O'Hare Field a while back. Um, you know, the big airport in Chicago? There was a rabbit that did not believe in airplanes. And that rabbit went out on the runway and lifted up its little rabbit foot at the control tower and said, if there is an airplane, let it come and strike me down. And it stood in the middle of the runway and nothing happened. And it said, huh, there are no airplanes. And it scampered off. God is like a control tower person that would not call a 747 to go mow down one rabbit that was shaking its fist. When humanity shakes its fist at God and says there's no God and persists in sin, look what God does, verse 22. With much long suffering, he endures that. But here's something important. The vessels of wrath prepared. Now, this is the key to understanding. God explains the, these, pre, these vessels of wrath. These we could call the ones that are reprobate. These are the ones that are going to hell. How do they get to hell? It says they're prepared. People prepare themselves. In the Greek language, there's two tenses, or or voices. The active, active is what it means, active. The other is passive. You've met active and passive people. The passive voice is here. This is passive. God is not actively, grammatically, this is indisputable, Grammatically, God is not actively putting people along the pathway that's going to head them into eternal destruction. You know what? This is actually a middle passive voice. It's called middle passive, and it means they're preparing themselves. They are preparing themselves. That's what it means, prepared. The middle passive voice is they are preparing themselves for hell. Remember I said the last month that nobody goes to hell because they didn't hear about Jesus. They all go to hell because they're what? Sinners. And sinners are preparing themselves for eternal destruction because they're piling up sin. And as Ezekiel says, our sins cover us like an avalanche. And, and when we come before God, we are avalanched in sin. You ever seen an avalanche? It just comes down the mountain. It just buries everything. All of us are buried in our sins apart from one who bore away our sins and bore away the sin of all who call upon the name of the Lord because they are saved. And so these people never call in the name of the Lord. They are in the middle passive voice preparing themselves for destruction. But look at the other group. And that he might, verse 23, make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Now we have an active voice there. This one is, is active, this active prepared. God is the one that anybody that goes to heaven doesn't get there on their own. They don't think of it. They don't initiate it. Uh, They don't purchase part of it. That's what religion says. God's involved, but you're involved. And and you hope that you can pile up enough, you know, to balance out, and you're going to try your hardest. And if you don't make it, the biggest religion in the world uh, says then your relatives can burn candles for you and do a few masses for you, and you'll make it. That's religion. That's human achievement. Salvation is divine accomplishment. God, by one sacrifice forever, paid the price of sin. So, first of all, with Romans 9, God is not actively uh, electing people to hell. Never says that in the Bible. Now, that was the first controversy. And I want to show you, uh, I don't know which side of this thing I use, so I'll just use this side. Um, I want to show you how long the church has been dealing with this because this is not new. And that's why I I was talking with uh, one of the staff members and he was chuckling. He chuckled a lot. And he said, "Um, I don't know why you're having the Q&A on that subject because he said it can't be answered. And I said, Yeah, that's true. That's true. But we do need to help people to understand how to fit things together. So back here with St. Augustine. You've heard of St. Augustine. Uh, By the way, Calvin did not think of Calvinism. St. Augustine thought of it. It was a response in his, he lived from 346 to, 
I mean about, to 430 A.D. So 30, what is that, 54, he lived about 84 years. Wow, Augustine was an old timer. Um, but there was a, a monk from Britain. Now we're in the British, I mean in the Roman Empire that, that surrounded the Mediterranean. And Augustine was living in what we would call Algeria today. That was a huge part of uh, the Roman Empire, Northern Africa. It went from Morocco all the way across to Egypt and up into Israel and around Turkey and all the way around, all the way up to Britain. And there was a monk during this time period in about the year 400 AD whose name was Pelagius. And Pelagius made a trip to Rome. Augustine was in Algeria, across the Mediterranean from Rome, a short boat ride. Pelagius came all the way across and started preaching that no one absolutely fell into sin and that all of us basically are a little bit good and if you can just stir up the good within yourself and if you can surround yourself with good, you will get better and better and better until you are sinless. That's called Pelagi, today, Pelagianism. Um, in fact, there's a Mormon scholar, not a Christian scholar, a Mormon scholar that said Mormonism is Pelagian to the core. Isn't that interesting? It's this perfectibility of man. Pelagianism is at the heart of what we would call liberal churches. Churches that don't preach the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. They just say, try your hardest, be good, kind of Norman Vincent Peale stuff, you know, just be positive, you know, that kind of stuff. Pelagianism is the idea that we can save ourselves and we kind of get it started and God finishes it or helps us or something like that. And so Augustine was opposing Pelagius. And Augustine set out the idea of the sovereign election of God, in fact, the, the, what we would call the TULIP acronym. Basically, Augustine presented that concept. It's called Augustinian theology. So that's where it went. Well, after Pelagius was knocked out, then things went to what's called semi-Pelagianism. Uh, and and what, what it was was they wanted to preserve man's free will. And so for the dignity of man, that, that it was against what's called determinism, that no one, and the idea that you don't have any choice, like why even live? God's already picked who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. I have no choice in the matter. Everything's determined and it's nothing. And, and that has troubled people from the very beginning. We're all reading the same 31,000 verses. And, and theologians from Britain, Pelagius, theologians from Algeria, Augustine, have, have disagreed over this. So the controversy went on and on for a long time. And what's interesting is, and I want to show you the verses that they're working with. I want to show you why it's such a struggle. So let's, let's just do a little Bible study on whether or not, because the key, the whole thing hinges on the middle piece of the acronym. Um, by the way, if you've ever heard of this, this TULIP, you've heard of that, right? Yeah, that's the acronym for Calvinism. It's the flower of the Calvinists. Remember the Calvinists and this whole thing started in Netherlands, you know, and that's where this was the council or the synod of Dort in 1618 came up with this. So this is the flower of Calvinism. What flower is it? Tulip. Do you know what the flower of Arminianism is? The daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. <laughs> you know, uh, that's an old joke. Uh, but the total depravity. Now let me show you why this is... Uh, that's easy to find. You just go from Romans 3.10 onward. Uh, in fact, all of Romans 3, you've got it. And many other places, Romans 1 and everywhere else. The unconditional election, what does that mean? Well, election means to pick. It means God picked us uh, not on the basis of us doing something that merited his favor. In other words, that it's not on the basis of of us uh, believing. He didn't pick us because we believed. We believed because he picked us. And so it's the idea of um, 
Well, how about what it says in 1 Peter 1, verse 2, uh, that we're chosen. I mean, it's as clear as day, and it's not just in 1 Peter 1, 2. It's all the way through. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Then we get down to this irresistible grace, and... Uh, And boy, that's clear. It's all the way through the scriptures. I mean, we can look at them. Look at John 6. In fact, we should look at these because you probably, you know, need to see if you believe this. Look at John 6 with me, and we'll look at all the rest of them. But I want to show you something because you notice that, that I'm going to leave one out because it's the one that's not in the Bible, and it's the middle one. It's the one I'm going to leave out, but the perseverance of the saints is the last one. Uh, and we could go for that to John 10 and Jude 24 and many, many other places. But look at John 6 with me, because I want to show you something. I want to show you each of these, that uh, they are easily definable in the Bible, the, the general concept. Now, I mean, some of these things have been discussed to such lengths that they go off the chart. They're not in the Bible. But the concept of this T-U-L-I-P, let's see what it is in the Bible. Starting with verse 37. Look at John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Do you know what that is? That's election. You want to see election in the Bible? There it is. The Father gave the Son. He gave him the gift of those who would come in faith to Christ. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. Now look at this. Why did he add this? This makes it very enchanting to think about. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. You know what that says? That, that salvation has two parts. We have the, the election, the Father giving, and, and that all that the Father gives will come to me. It's an irresistible Work of God, John six thirty seven. But then he adds the same thing Paul adds. Remember how Paul got saved? Was Paul wanting to get saved? Was he out looking for the Lord? No, he was trying to destroy every representation of Christ. And Jesus knocked him off his donkey or horse or whatever he was on on the way to Damascus, threw him into the dust, blinded him with his glory, and made him be day after day in darkness. And, and in that time, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, had a work of grace in his heart. You know what he says about it? He didn't say, I was forced to become a Christian. He said, I was not disobedient. I responded. So here's the response. Here's the free will, if you want to call it that. The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. I'm going to show you in just a minute how you reconcile those because actually what we always have in Scripture is seeing it from God's perspective and seeing it from our perspective. And you know what the problem is? People are trying to force God's perspective down here where it doesn't make sense and trying to impose our perspective on God. See, there's, there's, a, there's a divine view of salvation and there's a kind of street view, how we see it. And you know which one? We're supposed to have the divine view in the back of our mind saying, hey, God's got it all under control. But we're supposed to minister like Paul did. You know how Paul ministered? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do you know how Paul gave the gospel? He didn't, like a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, I helped him get started in ministry. Do you know what he told his church recently? Don't pass out tracts. You might give them to a non-elect person and they might think they got saved. What is that? Well, besides being wrong. It, it's not how Christ or the apostles were. Jesus did not look through the crowd and say, hey, only listen to me if you're one of the chosen. He, he said to everyone, Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30, come on to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. It was a a wide open offer of the gospel. But keep reading. Look what it says in verse 46. Now we're in John 6. We've looked at 37 and seen uh, the, this concept of this all 
the Father gives will come to me. They cannot resist it. Everybody that, that the Father gave me will come to me, 637 says. But look at verse 46. Uh, not 46, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Look at this. No one can come. We're all totally not God seekers. Now, there are nice people in the world. There are more nice and less nice people. There are more bad and less bad people. But we're all totally unable to make it to God. The gulf is too big. Our inability is too great. And so Jesus said, no one can come to me. We're all dead in our trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2. Unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up the last day. Wow. This is the idea that we're unable to come on our own, that only the ones that the Father gave the Son will be saved, but all the ones that the Father gave will come. Isn't that neat? And, and the Father will draw them. Now, look across the, the column. It's in verse 65. Jesus said this, same chapter. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Wow. See why there's a controversy? How can you preach the gospel to everybody, Hannah just asked, and not everybody be able to come? Why doesn't the Father just draw them all? That's, that's the heart, and that's never answered. I mean, it's answered in his justice, it's answered in his sovereignty, it's answered in his decrees, but it's not answered in plain English in the Bible. That's why there's a controversy. So, um, also, if you want this idea of the perseverance of the saints, just turn over a couple pages, chapter 10, more than a couple. Uh, Jesus said, like, look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, John 10, 27. I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. So that means they don't lose it. And then look at the rest of the verse. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That means that no one is going to be able to, to pull out that engrafted word. No, no Jehovah's Witness at the door, no slick, you know, cult is going to be able to, you know, there's people all the time that, that talk about their children that lost their faith in college. Actually, what this says is you can't lose your faith in college or anywhere else. Because no one can snatch you out, and you, you cannot perish. Now, what you can do is you, you can really get mixed up and confused, and, and you can start believing things that aren't true, but the Lord is at work in your heart and convicting you, and, and someone comes along and points out the truth. But you, don't, you aren't saved, and all of a sudden you go to college and get unsaved. That's not biblical. So this idea of the perseverance of the saints, in fact, uh, here's another one. Jude 24. You know, Jude only has one chapter. Just go to Revelation, and it's the book right before Revelation. So go to the end of the Bible. This is a tremendous verse. Um, because what it says is that the, the perseverance of the saints is not based on how hard we hold on. Remember I told you last time about my kids, uh, part of my hair loss was they used to hold my hair like reins riding a horse. And we had a lot of kids, so I had a lot of, you know, pressure up there. And they would be rocking back and forth, riding on my shoulders, holding on for dear life, clutching fistfuls of my hair. What they didn't realize till they got a little older was that their staying on my shoulders safe and sound was not dependent on how hard they held on. I had them in a lock grip. I had their, their little legs here. I mean, they could have tried to do a somersault, and they couldn't have gotten off because they were locked in. And, and look what it says in the, in the last two verses of Jude. It only has one chapter, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Wow. 
and to present you faultless before his presence uh, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever the lord is able to keep us from falling in fact i, I just got a text from someone and he says hey what does hebrews 6 mean i said well, i can tell you what it doesn't mean because no hard to understand verse in the bible overturns a page full of clear ones. And, and so you don't, you don't make doctrines on obscurity, you make it on clarity. And, and it very clearly says in the Bible that, that this concept that we cannot lose our salvation, we persevere, that the, all that the Father gives will come, that, that he chose us, we didn't choose him. John 15, uh, you did not choose me, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that we're totally unable on ourselves to do it. But what is this that I left out? This is called limited atonement. That's the middle piece. Now, R.C. Sproul, who is a beloved, dear, wonderful man of God, who every time I've ever heard him speak, moved my heart almost to tears. He's one of the most wonderful, profound Bible teachers, doctrinal teachers, and everything, but R.C. Sproul says if you don't believe in the limited atonement, you're one of those Pelagians. You're a semi-Pelagian. You're an Arminian. Um, but the problem is limited atonement is not in the Bible. And so what he's saying is logically you would be that. But let me show you uh, what the Bible does say. And let's just look at several verses on the limited atonement. Um, Let's start in Isaiah 53, the, the gospel in the Old Testament, okay? And, and um, you might not appreciate some of these, you know, if you're a strong limited atoner or atonementist. Uh, by the way, I believe in an unlimited, limited atonement. Emphasis on unlimited, that's the perspective we're supposed to have on earth. Limited, that's God's perspective. And since I'm not omniscient, uh, and since I'm not eternal, and I don't have foreknowledge, I don't see this limited thing. It's logical, but it's not presented in the Bible. But God does know who's going to be in heaven already. If he's preparing a place for us, he seems to know who's coming, right? And so he already has seen the end. And I'm not saying that he picked him by what he saw, you know, foreseen faith. God already knows for whom Christ died. But when he presents it to us, look how he presents it. Here's Isaiah 53. Now don't decide on one verse. What I'm going to show is there are so many verses. You can't deny plain English okay uh, he uh, Isaiah 53 uh, I'll start in verse 5 but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all okay you'd say Maybe that's only talking about the saved people in Israel and us. Okay, so there's one. And, of course, that's not what it says. But you could get that. So let's go to the Gospel of John. Let's just fast forward to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And I want to show you that, that when I read uh, and I collect commentaries, I have uh, maybe 1,500 Bible commentaries of all kinds, and uh, I'm talking about literal books. You add to that electronic books, I have 5,000 electronic books, and I have 1,500 commentaries and thousands of books in total in print, but I mean, if you read the commentaries, when the people that believe in the limited atonement cover these verses, what they keep saying is, that couldn't mean that, that couldn't mean that, no matter what, it can't mean that, it can't mean that. And, and when they keep doing that, you wonder, why can't it? First of all, there is no explicit statement. It does say Christ died for his bride. 
What it doesn't say is he, it doesn't say he didn't die for everybody else. And so you can't make an argument by saying, well, it says he, he died for his bride. Uh-huh, he did. It never says that he didn't die for the others. In fact, look what it does say, John 1, This is the introduction of Christ by John the Baptist, the, the last Old Testament prophet. And the next day, John 1, Gospel of John, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, and I can just see him pointing at Christ, because remember, he was, he was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way, and so he's like the introducer of Christ. And he's pointing at Jesus. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, now, you, you get a, a limited atonement commentator on this, and it goes, it's the world of the elect. That's what it's talking about. So you go, okay, world. Well, let's just take, you know, our concordance, you know. I carry my 99-cent concordance with me all the time on my phone. I always check things. And so let's see how John uses the world. And, and look, starting in verse 9 of the same chapter, that was a true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So world, you could say worldly the like there. He was in the world, verse 10, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Huh. That's interesting. The world, the world there isn't, John doesn't use world exclusively for the elect. So keep going in the book. Look at chapter 3 and verse 16. Now, same author, John, same vocabulary, world. And let's start in verse 16, most well-known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is a condemnation that light has come into the world, verse 19, and men love darkness rather than light. And I could go through the 80 times John uses the word world, and you know what? You can't. You can't squeeze the world into meaning the world of the elect. That is a, a term John uses, not for the elect. Love not the world, nor the things in the world. For all that is in the world, the less the flesh, less the eyes private. It's not of the Father, it's of the, it's of the devil. See, world, when you, when you read these commentators who 99% are right on, whenever they get near... These, these verses that say that Jesus died for the world, their system is so, it's a system, see? That's a, a unit. Those five pieces are sewn together like a sweater. If I was wearing a sweater, since it's supposed to snow tonight, I should have. If I pull out one of the knit together pieces of my sweater, and just start pulling that string, do you know what will eventually happen? My whole sweater will start unraveling. That's what they fear if this is ever disproved. But this was not found in the Scriptures. This is a logical deduction that Augustine came to in his argument against Pelagius. It's not something you get by reading the Bible. So let me show you some more. Let's get out of John. Let's go to... Um, Paul. First, how about 1 Timothy? And I'm just going through the classic verses that have always been used by Bible teachers throughout the centuries to say it's not biblical. It's only logical, that middle point. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is Paul. Therefore I exhort, first of all, what we're studying here is what does all mean? Okay? Do you remember... Uh, Bill Clinton had the big discussion on it, uh, you know, and what he was saying, you know, was, was he was trying to confuse everybody and, and deny. When something makes plain sense in the Scripture, there should not be an overturning of something that makes plain sense, like all. Look at all. I exhort, verse 1, first of all, that means out of everything, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I mean, we don't have much disagreement here. Isn't that kind of a call to universal prayer? Just pray. 
Pray, pray for people. Pray for the people when you hear about the, the, the tsunami. Pray for them when you hear about the cyclone. Pray for them when you hear about the, I mean, for me, the news, uh, if I ever, I don't hear it very often because I don't watch television, but, but when I see it online, it causes me to pray. Whenever I, I see that, I pray. And then for kings, verse 2, for all who are in authority, not just the good ones, uh, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God is by nature a Savior. Never forget that. Titus repeatedly is told that by Paul. God is a Savior. Timothy is told right here. Now here's back to Hannah's question. This God who is a Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There is no way without doing mental gymnastics, hermeneutical gymnastics, and forcing that verse into this. See, what happens is, if you start with a system, you've got to fit every verse into the system. And any that don't, you've got to force them in. Or you've got to talk them till people are blue in the face and just don't say what it means. Because there's hardly any way to understand this unless you have a complete system that is bearing its weight down on you saying it couldn't possibly mean that. Now see, Hebrews 6 says that they will fall away. But it doesn't say fall away from what? It doesn't say if they're even saved. It says they've tasted and they've been enlightened. But there are tons of verses that say clearly that you can never lose your salvation. There are pages of verses. There's one Hebrews 6 verse seems to imply something different. So the preponderance of weight goes against Hebrews 6, so we know it doesn't mean that. There are no verses that explicitly say that salvation is limited and the atonement was only paid for those going to heaven. It's interesting. The preponderance of verses is the opposite. Okay, keep going from there. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. Okay, let's see if... so. John thinks it's unlimited. Paul thinks it's unlimited. Let's go to Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews. Look what he says. He's describing Jesus, who is the greatest. And it says in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Now, what do you think that means? Well, if, if you're trying to make that verse fit in here, you say, well, he only tasted it. He didn't drink it. You know, like I didn't inhale. Who was that, Clinton that said that, you know? I smoked the marijuana, I just didn't inhale it, you know? I mean, what taste, death, how much of death do you have to taste? You have to swallow it all? You know, I mean, it, it just gets to be gymnastics. This verse and 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 6, to 99% of all people who are not forced to fit it into a grid says that Jesus died for, for whom? Everyone. It, it's amazing. Okay, now keep, keep going. Go to... First, or Second Peter. Let's go to Second Peter two. This gets really interesting. Second Peter two. Now here's Peter that started. Uh, I mean, Peter is as into election as possible to be. I mean, he starts his epistle in First Peter one and verse two, saying that we're elect uh, according to God's wonderful, marvelous sovereignty. But look at Second Peter two. Well, let's go to, to verse one. Second Peter two one. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Denying 
the saving work of Christ. That's who bought. Jesus is the Redeemer. Why didn't he stop there? Why didn't he say denying the redemption? What does he say about this, this verse, 2 Peter 2, 1, is a classic verse of people the Bible calls apostates. Apostates. The whole book of Jude and this chapter are about these apostates. Apostates are not going to heaven. Apostates are lost. Apostates are going to suffer the blackness of darkness forever, uh, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's as clear as possible to say that they are lost and hellbound. Okay? I mean, that is uh, replete in the scriptures. Apostates are, you don't want to be near one. And that's why it's not good to, to indiscriminately watch television and read books about theology because apostates are dangerous. It's kind of like walking barefoot through the southwest desert. If you don't get bit by a Gila monster, you'll probably get bit by a diamondback. You don't walk barefoot. You don't walk without protection theologically. A lot of people, they just surf the channels and they just listen to anything that comes and the devil sows these seeds of doubt. There are a lot of apostates. And you know what a lot of them are described in, in Jude and Peter? They make merchandise of the gospel. They sell it. But their own lives are, are immoral. And, and there's a whole history of them. But, but look what it says. Apostates are bad and they're going to hell. But look what it says in verse 1. These false prophets among the people, these apostates, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought, what does that next word say? Them. Peter, who knew Jesus better than any of us will this side of heaven, three and a half years, chasing Jesus, hanging on every word, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter, speaking inspired text, says that Jesus died the atonement covers apostates. That doesn't fit in that at all. It's amazing. So he goes on. I mean, the same Peter. Look across the page at chapter 3. In verse 9, the Lord's not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. He's long suffering toward us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, in light of chapter 2, Peter is presenting an amazing atonement view. Here's the last one. Look at 1 John. We start with John. Let's look at 1 John. It's the next page. Just turn the page to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. Now, this is probably the most amazing, and if you want to check out Uh, the limited atonement view, read any major limited atonement theologian on this verse. You know what what R.C. Sproul said? If 1 John 2.2 says what it sounds like it says, but we know it doesn't, how do we know it doesn't? Because, I mean, who am I to criticize? He knows more in his left lower lobe than I'll ever know, okay? But if you are completely committed to a system, you cannot have this piece out of the wall. So, so what he, sa- he starts out his commentary by saying, if it meant what it sounds like it means, you know, it would be terrible. But it doesn't mean that. And he just goes on and on and on and on and on with no biblical support. I mean, put one biblical verse in that says Christ died only for the bride. That he only died for the elect part of the world. That he only died for the all men in the world that are elect. It doesn't say that. All it says is he died for his bride, which he purchased his bride. There's no one that doubts he purchased his bride. But if you just read the verses, here it is. 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation. 
uh, hilasmas. Did you know in Hebrew that's the mercy seat? Jesus is the mercy seat. He's the propitiation. He is the, the covering for our sins. Now, who do you think our is? Believers, right? John is talking to Christians, and he says, my sins, your sins, our sins. Not only for our sins, not for ours only, but also, what does the rest of the verse say? Now, what do you think world means? See? When you have a contrast like that, he is the propitiation. He is the, uh, the mercy seat, the atoning, helasmas, propitiation for our sins who are believers, but not just for ours. He is the one who is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Since John already wrote that in John 1.29, he would certainly write 1 John 2.2 because he has a very consistent from God theology because that's why God picked him as one of his inspired writers. So what's interesting, even my most admired theologian in the world that I look up to more than anybody else, John MacArthur, if you read his study Bible, tell me what does he say? He doesn't give, on this verse, I have a copy. You do too. It's my favorite study Bible. I would commend it. If you haven't bought your Christmas presents, buy everybody you love a MacArthur study Bible. It's the most complete doctrinal guide. But he gets to this verse, and you know what he does? He starts going, blah, 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 blah. you know why? Because he can't say that the verse means what it says. And so what he says is it has to mean something else. And you know what? I admire him for that. He's very consistent. He is, and here's the last thing. We've got to go. Oh, I'm so glad you asked this, Hannah. It's one we can take the whole hour on. Um, I just want to show you how we got to this point, okay? And by the way, while I'm talking, I'll say this. Uh, most of this you can hardly understand unless you spend a long time um, studying even how we got to it because, for one thing, um, Calvin never, never heard of that TULIP acronym. They didn't invent that until after Calvin died. Uh, most people don't even realize this. Uh, John Calvin, uh, he died in uh, 1564. He was born in 15, I don't know, 09 or something like that. In fact, when Martin Luther posted his theses, Calvin was eight years old. So Martin Luther certainly wasn't a Calvinist because Calvin was only eight and wasn't even converted at that time. But you've heard of Arminius, Jacob Arminius, you know, Arminianism? Arminius wasn't born I think till 1560, and I think he lived till 1609. So, uh, Arminianism, Calvin wasn't, there was no Arminianism when Calvin did this. Arminius didn't write his thing until 1609. And by the way, after he was dead is where we get the tulip. That comes in 1618. So, all this to say that it's not as simple as it sounds. You know, people swing around, you know, Calvinism and Arminianism, and they have no idea that Arminius did not write Arminianism, and Calvin didn't write Calvinism. Calvin wrote his Institutes, and by the way, you ought to read what he said on 1 John 2.2. 2. He preached through that. Very interesting what he says. He says almost the same thing that Spurgeon says. Spurgeon says, Spurgeon's a Calvinist, and Spurgeon said on John 1.29 that Jesus paid the price for the totality of the sin of the world. How does he get the L out of that? But okay, how do we get, how do we get to this? Well, this is what I call, and this is my last thing I'm going to show you, and this is something we all should, should work on. You take verses in the Bible, like John 6, the ones I showed you, and those say that only the Father can draw. And then, you know, you get the Ephesians 1, 4 about elect, and you get a bunch of other verses. And you, you take these verses and you, you draw conclusions from them. Like this. You know, you take a verse and you get conclusions. Now, this is the Bible. And this is biblical truth or doctrine. 
or you could call it orthodox doctrine, because it's, it's straight with the Bible. Everything, you know, you can find biblical support. So, T-U-I-P. T-U-I-P. I left out a letter. How do you get the L? Like this. You say that we were chosen to him for the foundation of the world, and no one can come unless he be drawn, and the Lord is not willing that, that any should perish, and so therefore, Christ died only for the elect. Now, this is not tied to any verse. There is no verse. This argument's been going on since 430 A.D., and no one's answered it. Because when Calvin, I mean, when Augustine started this, it wasn't attached to any verses. It was attached to theology, to other doctrines, and it was logical. And you know what? It is logical. It's very illogical for me that Jesus died for anybody that's not in heaven. Why would he waste his precious, omniscient, sovereign, sacrificial blood? So it's not logical that Jesus died for the world. But it's biblical. Because I only gave you seven verses. You go to, to the argument that's been going on, and you, you can get dozens of verses. But no one can give you a verse that says, many verses say for the whole world, and they say, well, world means the elect. No verse says only the elect. So, to answer Hannah's question, from God's perspective, when we get to heaven, on up there, we're going to look back, and on the doorway, it's going to say, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But, Revelation 22 closes with whosoever will let him come. The gospel from a human perspective is presented by God as available and open to everybody. That's how he presented it, including Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world. Not just our sins. So you know what? You can look like I did today. You can look in the eye of two visitors that came through the line today. And I said, hey, I have a question for you. Do you know for sure that all of your sins are forgiven? And they took a step back and they thought, I came here to get a free gift bag. What are you doing asking me <laughs> theological questions, you know? <laughs> Tricking me. And I said, no, no, no trick. Just asking you. And both of them were honest. I mean, they realized I wasn't trying to, you know, hurt them or scare them or anything. And they both said no. I am not. And I can look him in the eye and say, Jesus Christ offers to you today the absolute complete forgiveness of every sin, past, present, and future. And the only limit on his atonement is whether or not you will believe and, and embrace and receive him as the gift. Now, will they? I don't know. God knows. He only, he only will draw them if he wants to. He'll only draw them if he chose them. But I can't understand that. And I have to tell you that no one has fully been able to get their head around this because it's never been solved. So all through life, we're supposed to share the gospel like whosoever will can come. And we have the confidence when they reject it or when we don't know what happened to them that God is doing his part. He chose, he'll draw, and he'll bring those he gave to the Son. Someone, in fact, his name was uh, Anselm Abelard, I don't know which one, said this. You've probably heard it. That the atonement of Christ was sufficient for the world, but efficient for the elect. That's fine, as long as you keep the efficiency up here in heaven, in eternity, and the sufficiency down here. 
Because that's the gospel that Jesus taught and Peter and Paul and John, and that's the gospel we're supposed to share. And it's 7.15, and you're going to be glued to your chairs like that poor person in New York City. So let's all stand. And uh, uh, next question and answer. It's going to be very exciting because Hannah's question we won't bring up again unless someone else brings it up, okay? But obviously, you notice I didn't really answer that. I just told you how I think. And by the way, this is called theological drift. When, you, when the boat is not tied directly to the pier, when it's, when it's tied to something that's moving and being deduced, this is theological drift. Doesn't mean it's false and it doesn't mean it's wrong. All it means is it's not connected to the Bible. And, and we should utterly fight for what's in the Bible and we should have a love for, as long as it's not wrong, for this theological drift. Okay, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, the word of God, the living and abiding word of God, the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Thank you that that word says that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in him will never perish but have endless life. And that's the gospel we share knowing that no one will come unless you pull them because we're so sinful. And so I pray that that, that tension, that antinomy would always, that paradox would always stay there and we wouldn't try and answer it away since you're the one that put it there. And I thank you for your word that we can talk about forever. And it's such a blessing. May it inspire us to share the gospel with everyone we meet. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.